go ahead and hit record. Thank you, Christina, record as well. All right, so welcome in this morning um, from everywhere that you are joining us within the region or from other places just outside of our region. Um, my name is Amanda Curra. Today you are joining us um, from uh, our Great Lakes Rota RC presentation. This is Nutrition as a Pathway to Recovery. Today's session is being hosted by our regional partner, UW-Madison Division of Extension. So we just want to thank them for being our, uh, for sponsoring our speakers today. Again, my name is Amanda Curra. I am your host today. I am also the Technical Center's Regional Project Manager. Before we get into our presentation, we have a few quick housekeeping items to address. The first is to make mention of our funder and funding activity. We are a Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration or SAMHSA funded project. We are Region 5 that covers Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Minnesota, Ohio, and Wisconsin. As far as our funding activities, we provide virtual and or on-demand education, evidence-based resource, resources and research, as well as technical outreach to professionals working in and with rural communities. We want to just take a moment to promote the use of affirming and person-first language when discussing behavioral health disorders. Um, as we do this, we want to create an environment of learning together, and we want that to feel welcoming and safe for everyone. And so let's work together to manage a space that supports this non-stigmatizing, recovery-orientated language that can help reduce that negative bias and promote engagement. As we learn about successful prevention, treatment, and recovery, we welcome you formally into the Great Lakes Rota RC Community of Learning. Let's move now uh, into introducing you to our two speakers today. Dr. Heather Norman Bergdolf is an assistant professor in the Dietetics and Human Nutrition uh, program at the University of Kentucky. Her work includes translating research into an extension program related to nutrition recovery. Joining us as well is Dr. Alec Ellswick, who is an assistant professor and extension specialist for substance use recovery and prevention at the University of Kentucky. Kentucky. He is also the co-founder of Voice for Hope, which is a peer-driven recovery organization, and he is also a person in long-term recovery. We welcome Dr. Ellswick back as a presenter through our regional center. Some of you may remember his presentation on Rock Bottom Has No Basement. We recommend that you check out that recording and the resources of that event by Dr. Ellswick on the Great Lakes Road RC website at your convenience. I want to hand you over now to our presenters, uh, Dr. Heather and Dr. Alex. All right, good morning. Thank you so much, Amanda, for the introductions. And um, I, I frequently tell folks when we're doing virtual programming, um, especially since I don't have to travel from my home, that sometimes I feel like uh, you're doing all the work to set the table and we just show up and sit down and eat, which is really nice. So I appreciate all the work that, that you all do. Um, so that we can just share some of this information. Um, so I'll start with introductions uh, really briefly. Heather, if you'll change the slide. Um, Dr. Alex Ellswick, uh, you know me. We, um, at least some of you who join for our Rock Bottom Has a Basement um, session, will touch on a couple of aspects that are related, but we're really going in a different direction. Today, the focus is really about the connection between nutrition and substance use disorder recovery. And that's why I'm delighted to be really not sharing time, but, but putting the spotlight on Dr. Norman Bergdolf and her work and her expertise. Um, I'm a baseball fan, so forgive the baseball analogy, but I'm going to be like the setup man. So I'm going to come in in the eighth inning and set it up for Heather, and Heather's the closer, and, and she's going to take us home. Uh, I'm just thinking how, we, like how many times we want them to see our picture. I know. I, I, I'm, I thought about it, suggesting that we delete one of them, but... I mean, no, I love it. I love it. Go. So um, thank you all for having me. I'm super excited to be here to expand my network and to, to see this group and hear about the things that you all are doing. Um, as I already said, I am faculty in the Department of Dietetics and Human Nutrition here at the University of Kentucky. And I also wear uh, a hat in the extension world. So um, I also serve as an extension specialist alongside Alex. And, you know, as we've worked together over the past couple of years, we realized, hey, there is um, this common space that we really could intersect and, and explore together. And I'm going to share a little bit about the work extension here at Kentucky 
is working within the space of nutrition and substance use in a little bit. Um, but again, just thank you for being here. I'm going to, Alex, it's a, ba a baseball reference. He's going to set us up. Um, I'm going to hand it back to you as we kind of dive in. Okay. So our objectives for the day um, are primarily threefold. To start by identifying nutrition-related challenges faced by people who use drugs, people in recovery from substance use disorders, there are many. There are a plethora. We're going to touch on the most important and the most salient, but I don't think we could possibly address all aspects of nutrition-related challenges for people in recovery in an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. I think importantly, we'll nutrition during recovery. This is really where Dr. Norman Bergdolf brought her expertise to bear on um, helping people like me, helping me and my friends um, to have better outcomes, engaging with treatment and sustaining recovery. And then we'll consider the impact of sustained nutritional wellness on long-term recovery. Um, and so I'm glad for the opportunity to kind of set that up. Uh, if you'll change the slide for me, please. Yeah. And um, I'll just add to really quick, I'm sorry. Fine. We're, we're gonna go back and forth. You know, talking to Amanda before this session even started, how there was a lot of interest in this topic because it's not necessarily something that you typically think about when you think about substance use recovery. And so I think even an umbrella, um, you know, goal that I have for this talk is really just opening your eyes up to this really important topic that is understudied, um, underrepresented in the literature and really just as a new consideration for you moving forward when you think about substance use recovery populations. So, sorry. Absolutely. Well, it's a perfect segue because really what I wanna do with my time is set up the, the foundation. Why is nutrition an important part of a foundation for a healthy human being and healthy recovery? And so I wanna start just by sharing a couple of stories um, related to just my experience. So I'm not gonna you know, detail my whole addiction and recovery experience, don't have nearly the time for that, but really briefly for those who don't know, I'm a person in recovery. Um, I'm a person who had a lot of risk factors, genetic predisposition, I have multiple anxiety disorders. So kind of the risk was there. And then I got prescribed opioids when I was 18 years old and I got addicted and addiction took me all the bad places people go um, to, to jail, in and out of treatment centers and um, in, in homelessness. I experienced homelessness in four different cities and slept under a bridge, panhandled for money, all that kind of thing, and, and ended up finding recovery September 13th, 2013. And um, when people ask me what it was, you know, that enabled me to recover, what was the difference? The simplest answer that I give is recovery capital. It's access to all of these things that I, that I had access to that so many of my friends don't or didn't. Um, and so we're going we're gonna to touch on that in just a minute. But before I do, I wanted to share with you a couple of experiences I had through really through my lifetime and, and particularly through addiction and recovery that relate to food that I think are relevant, that I was just thinking about in preparation for this. And the first is when I was pretty young in my home, we had a rule. My mom <laughs> primarily enforced a rule, a, a one soda a day rule, right? So you can have a soda, but you can only have one. And I am a person who loves anything that gives me dopamine and sugar gives me dopamine. And my dad, when I was really young, would comment on the way that I drank my one soda per day because I would try to savor it so much. And he just pointed out that there was something that seemed kind of odd about it, that it seemed different. I'm not sure that there's anything substantive there, but that's always been in the back of my mind. And then when I got addicted, everything changed in terms of my eating patterns. Um, I lost my appetite completely. I'm going to touch on this, expand on this a little bit in a moment um, by grounding this in brain science. But you know, essentially, what happens is uh, when 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 people begin using drugs and the reward pathway is hijacked, uh, food can't compete with a drug as a reward, right? I think that's kind of intuitive, like cocaine versus carbohydrates. It's it's not a fair match, and and so people sort of deprioritize food, and that's certainly what I did. Um, and you know, I was 45 pounds underweight and I looked rough and I remember, um, not being conscious of meal times, which is wild because today I'm very sensitive to meal times. Uh, as soon as we're finished here, it's going to be 1130 local time. I'm going to start getting hungry because it's time for lunch. You know, when I was addicted, I really mean to tell you that, um, 
I didn't experience hun hunger pangs. You know, I experienced cravings for, for heroin, not food. And so it really dysregulates the experience of, um, of, of eating and of, of appetite and your, your hunger. Um, another thing that's just related is my dad's always pointed out the relationship between my drug use and my exercise habits. I am a religious exerciser, uh, like 5 a.m. I'm 5 a.m. club when I'm not using. Um, and when I experience relapse, there's a one-to-one -one relationship. I'd stop exercising like that because all of a sudden I didn't need to go and work for the dopamine that I'm getting from, from a drug, essentially. It's the way that I experienced at least. So that was addiction. And then one more story I want to share with you related to recovery because so I, when I was addicted, I would go days at a time and I would eat nothing but like a box of Pop-Tarts, right? Because you don't really need food when you're addicted for sustenance. You need heroin. And early in recovery um, at the Salvation Army, I was at this homeless shelter in Dayton. And on Saturday mornings, we got bread donated from the day-old bread store and they would make biscuits and sausage gravy. And I know that we're talking to folks from the North. So you all might not really know what I'm talking about when I talk about, but I mean, like it, it gives me a special warm feeling when I say biscuits and sausage gravy. And it was the wildest thing because I would go to bed on a Friday night at this homeless shelter in Dayton, Ohio. And I was giddy like a kid on Christmas Eve, like, oh boy, we're going to have biscuits and sausage gravy tomorrow. And it's, it seems like such a silly example, but I think it's really meaningful because for me, what it represented, number one, was hope because it was the first time that I got a good feeling out of something other than a drug. Granted, it probably wasn't the healthiest thing to substitute food for, for substances, and I packed on a ton of weight when I was in treatment, and that wasn't healthy. Um, but there was something good and pure and natural about getting a good feeling out of food and not, um, and not out of a drug. And and for me, the, the second thing that was so important about that is that it represented real healing in my brain. And so even though I didn't understand this when I was at this homeless shelter in 2013, I didn't understand any of the science behind addiction, but I was experiencing it. And I was experiencing what it's like when dopamine is upregulating, is returning to my brain, and I can, I can begin to experience the fullness of life again. So I, I wanna just, in setting kind of the foundation um, for what Heather's gonna provide for you, I wanna make sure that I always ground everything that I do to recovery capital. It's my, um, my framework for understanding my own life experience, my own addiction, my own recovery. You know, when I got to graduate school, the burning question in my mind was why me? Why are my, fr why are my friends in jail? Why are my friends in cemeteries? And I'm here and I don't understand what's different. And as I looked back, it was this stuff, recovery capital. So the simplest way to understand it is it is the stuff of recovery. Anything that predicts recovery, that improves the likelihood of recovery, those things fall under this umbrella. So I like to start with the graphic on the right. Um, it's just something that, that I created that represents kind of the three basic domains of recovery capital. Um, so personal recovery capital is all these individual aspects. Do you have stable housing? Are you eating nutritious foods, right? Do you, are you getting nutrients from your meals? Um, the, the state of your physical health, the state of your mental health, your education, your employment. And what's interesting about these things, and, and this is something that Heather touched on earlier, is that for so many of us, these things are secondary in recovery. I think if you asked the average person what people need to recover from their addictions, the first thing that comes to mind is rehab, is treatment. And so they say, well, first the priority needs to be we get them to treatment and then we'll worry about this other stuff. And if you join me for our last session, what we talked about pretty extensively is why that's so problematic and why having recovery capital mitigates the harms associated with addiction and provides a foundation for recovery. So if, you know, if, if we're expecting people to get abstinent without the benefit of all these things, they don't have all the things they need to sustain recovery. And so I like to put recovery capital next to Maslow's hierarchy. And it's especially appropriate, I think, today, as we're talking about nutrition, because the foundation of Maslow's hierarchy includes food and water and nutrition. It's the, the most important aspect of building a healthy human being. You know, Maslow said, you can't, you can't begin building self-esteem if you haven't addressed your physiological needs. And we all know that intuitively. We know that a kid is going to struggle to 
to, to be competent in school when they don't have food in their stomach and they don't have a good night's sleep and a safe place to lay their head at. You know, it's, we know this stuff, but for some reason, sometimes when we're working with people who use drugs or people with substance use disorders, we treat them like they're this entirely separate entity. And I'm here to tell you that people who use drugs are more alike other human beings than they are different from other human beings, right? They have so many of the same basic needs and certainly nutrition is um, foundational to that. Um, as I was just kind of doing some background on this, I found a, a, a study that, a survey that found that 7% of residential treatment centers incorporate any type of um, nutrition intervention into, into treatment. So despite the fact that it's foundational, it's, it's clearly something that we think of as not as important, as secondary, as fluff. I think a lot of people think of it as fluff. Um, so, so last thing I'll say about that, not only is, is nutrition clearly foundational to every human being, but it's particularly important to a population who are marginalized, you know, who um, experience disproportionate mental illness, disproportionate physical disability. Dis this is probably the, the population that needs adequate nutrition the most. And then always, when I talk about recovery capital, I like to include this graphic because it's a really simple way of showing that the reason that recovery capital leads to remission, which is just another way of saying recovery, the reason recovery capital predicts recovery is because it reduces stress. And we mean all forms of stress. Uh, broadly conceived, biopsychosocial stress is the primary cause of relapse. We can, we can break that down in different ways kind of is a semantic thing, but at the end of the day, it's stress. That's the simple answer. Stress drives relapse. And so anything that we do that reduces stress improves the odds of recovery. And recovery capital does just that. It reduces the stress that people experience. When I improve my housing, I reduce stress. When I improve my nutrition, I reduce stress, right? Um, okay, slide please. Um, so the connection. What is the connection here between nutrition and substance use? And I wanna talk through uh, a few that are really important. And the first, I kind of identified already in sharing my own experience with irregular eating patterns. My eating could not have been less regular <laughs> during my addiction. It was one of the many causes of, um, of conflict in my relationship, my, my relationship with my um, partner at the time, because I didn't ever wanna go out to eat anywhere. <laughs> because I wasn't ever hungry, didn't ever have an appetite, wasn't even, wasn't even on, my, um, on my radar. And then dis, in addition to the fact that people have this dysregulated appetite, people who use drugs and, and people with substance use disorders face disproportionate food and nutrition insecurity. And to be totally uh, upfront with you, I didn't create this slide. Uh, Dr. Norman Bergdorf created this slide, but I love the fact that she, um, didn't just say food insecurity, but said food and nutrition insecurity, because I think it's really a more appropriate term. We see it so much in the eastern part of our state, in, in rural communities in the state of Kentucky, where folks don't necessarily face food insecurity. They have access to food, but it's not nutritious, you know, not nutrient dense foods. They're, they're processed foods. It's fast food. Um, don't really have the same access to fruits and vegetables to get the micronutrients they need to take care of their bodies. And then within this already limited set of nutrition options, people who use drugs tend to make poor choices, even within that limited set. So I just recently found a qualitative study um, that was a, a sort of a qualitative analysis of what people who use drugs eat. And it said that their primary diets consist of sweets, soft drinks, and snacks. And that is exactly true of my experience. If you go to a treatment center, or even if you go to a 12-step meeting, even among people who are in recovery, who have some time in recovery, you're going to see a lot of energy drinks. You know, you're going to see a lot of combining caffeine with nicotine. It's just a way of trying to access some more dopamine, right? Um, and then these folks who are making poor decisions within their already limited set of options are then not absorbing adequately the very few nutrients that they're that they're ingesting, and and so you know essentially our bodies are becoming less efficient, a less efficient mechanism because um, we don't have the nutrients that we need. Um, dysregulated 
endocrinology, a dysregulated endocrine system is so much more important than any of us have understood. And um, I have a couple of friends who are interested. We've been talking about it for a couple of years, but we're interested in doing some research on this very thing because in particular, we know that opioid use, um, chronic opioid use dysregulates um, the, the endocrine system and in particular, like testosterone and estrogen and can impact somebody's ability to, um, to, to gain muscle mass or to lose uh, body fat or um, you know, all of the things that come with dysregulated hormones. It's something that we haven't thought a lot about, even though it's a well-established finding in the literature. We've known it since the 70s with people who take methadone um, who have you know, sexual dysfunction and all sorts of consequences as a result of, um, of chronic exposure to opioids. Um, okay, but there's also a, another big connection that I want to make. So if you'll change the slide for me, please. This is um, really interesting. So in some ways, the, the genetic material that predicts substance use and addiction, I guess we should really say addiction, is the same genetic material, is some of the same gen genetic material that predicts obesity and disordered eating. And so that's why people who use drugs and people with substance use disorders are at increased risk of either having a co-occurring um, eating disorder, which is not uncommon, or of developing disordered eating in recovery, which is very common. And that could be either a binge eating disorder or the other way, some type of restricted eating pattern. And that has everything to do with the brain. So Heather, if you'll change the slide for me there, please. I'm gonna give you, this is a, the last little bit of what I'm gonna share with you all is these last three slides then I'll hand it over. But I think it's so important, if I'm gonna give a foundation for a discussion about addiction, then we have to talk about the brain. And that's especially true when we're talking about nutrition because this is where so much of this connection lies. So the, the briefest 101 version of, of brain science, when we use a drug, it causes uh, a spike in dopamine. And dopamine is your feel-good neurotransmitter. That's why people experience euphoria, experience a high, right? But through repeated exposure to drugs, our brain doesn't like the volatility of going up over and over and over again. And so your brain kind of adjusts on its own and it stops producing as much dopamine so that tomorrow when you use the drug, instead of going way up out of control, it brings you into a normal place, a balance where you can function. So the long-term consequence of chronic exposure to drugs in the brain is dopamine levels going down, 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 down over time. And so that's what you see reflected here or sort of illustrated here. These are PET scans, they're positron emission tomographies that allow us to look at dopamine activity in people's brains. And the brain on the far left is that healthy, normal control. And the brain in the middle is the brain of someone who's addicted, in this case, to methamphetamine. And you can see that the, they're bereft of dopamine. They don't have the dopamine that they need. You can see why food wouldn't be so motivating in some sense to that brain that's lacking the dopamine that it needs for that motivation. You can see why that brain might require something stronger like a drug to really motivate it, to really provide it with enough of a stimulus. And so uh, just a couple of important things to point out here. Number one, the most important thing I wanted to point out is that at its core, Addiction is about dopamine. All addictions are about dopamine. And because addiction is about dopamine, that means anything that we can do that expedites upregulating dopamine, that helps us bring back dopamine faster, is a really important part of recovery. And it turns out nutrition can do exactly that. Number two, nutrition can help with all other important aspects of brain function, you know, like prefrontal cortical function, um, our ability to. Um, make decisions and weigh consequences and all that kind of stuff. Um, but there's one last connection that I think is probably most important for today. And that is this. This is also a PET scan, also looking at dopamine activity in the brain. But here we're not looking at someone who uses drugs on the right. Here we're looking at someone whose body mass index is considered obese. And what you see is the same phenomenon. And I think this is so important. It's part of the evidence I provide for folks to tell them that you can become addicted to just about anything that brings you pleasure. We used to think that there were all these criteria for calling something an addiction, but what we're seeing is the brain of someone who's addicted to pornography is down-regulated of dopamine like this. And the brain of someone who has a compulsive shopping habit is down-regulated of dopamine like this. We're seeing this distinct commonality. 
And so what I find so interesting about that is a couple of things. I mean, one, that we think of these as entirely different behaviors. Having a problem with food is so much more socially acceptable than having a problem with drugs. But isn't it interesting that at the end of the day, it's the same problem in your brain. At the end of the day, it's a lack of dopamine and it's people who don't have enough dopamine who are chasing dopamine, right? And so another interesting connection here is that we could say this brain on the right could be downregulated of dopamine because it's had so much exposure to sugars and carbohydrates and that kind of thing. Or, and I think this is a more interesting explanation, that this is showing the, the shared genetic similarities between obesity or disordered eating and uh, substance use disorder. Because in both cases, you have people who are born with these alleles that give them low dopamine tone. So in like the, the simplest of terms, basically, if you have this, these, these genes, you're being born with not enough dopamine. And you're being born at enough of a deficit that you're having to go out in the world and try to replace it for yourself. And we can do that in the form of so many different things. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Last slide. Let me share this last slide and then I'm going to hand it over to Heather and I'm going to get out of everybody's way. Okay? You're good. Because nutrition has become an important part of my recovery. It's not something I ever thought about before addiction. I'm not sure to what extent I would have thought about it after addiction, um, or, or if I hadn't ever become addicted, I, I think it's become a really important part of it be, because I've come to understand the science. So what are some of the things that nutrition can do? Contribute to physical healing processes in the body. And this is so important because we're not just healing an addicted brain. We're also healing an addicted body. And it's a body that's experienced all the malnutrition, all the deficiencies that we've talked about, but that might also be fighting diseases, you know, cirrhosis of the liver or something like that. Obviously, someone who has better nutrition is going to be better positioned to fight off those diseases or infections than those who aren't. Secondly, nutritious foods are going to give you energy. And my goodness, it's hard to underestimate how important this is. One of the biggest criticisms I hear levied against people in treatment centers is that they are uh, non-compliant or they lack motivation. And it's interesting because number one, they lack the chemical in their brain that they need for motivation. So we're moralizing that even though we know they don't have what they need. And number two, they haven't been eating the food that they need to have adequate energy. In some sense, it's kind of like, of course they're demotivated. They would have to be this demotivated organism because they don't have the, the, the energy. Um, helping the, as we talked about, helping the body heal, helping the body fight off infection. We talked about supporting brain health. The last point that I want to make here before I pass it off is, is simply put, good nutrition reduces stress. It does that in a variety of ways that um, Dr. Norman Bergdahl is, is going to share with you. But in particular, I think about being in 12-step meetings early in recovery and seeing people drinking an energy drink at a 9 o'clock, a 9 p.m. meeting, and they're slamming an energy drink, and they're having two cigarettes before the meeting and two cigarettes after, and that's like their diet. And um, you can imagine how that raises cortisol levels, how that puts you in an elevated state of fight or flight, which is going to impact your ability to work, your ability to parent, your ability to, your ability to do all those things. So, all right, Heather, I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> no, that was great. And I, I think I actually want to spend a little bit more time on this slide because um, I was actually just sitting here thinking about how you know, I mentioned that this this field, this area is understudied and, you know, there's an underrepresentation when we look in the literature on this topic. Um, and, and my background itself is in nutritional sciences and, and my training focused on chronic metabolic conditions and not once was substance use disorder ever mentioned in any of my graduate work or any of the training that I received. And that's just, I just really had that revel, revel, uh, revelation, which is eye-opening because there is such a lack um, of work that's taking place in this space. Um, and I know someone mentioned in the chat that they'd like to see a paper that Alex referenced. I actually have a couple other really good reviews on this topic that I would be happy to kind of pass along with the slide after the presentation and we'll be sure to get that mural um, into people's hands. Um, it, you know, and Alex has mentioned this already in, in different ways, but just this idea of malnutrition uh, when someone is using drugs. And we can think of malnutrition essentially as an imbalance because it could be uh, the deficiencies that were mentioned or it could be excess, right? If all of your, 
if you, all of your food and nutrition is really only coming from one fuel source, which most, most likely is like a high sugar food, um, again, that could be excess as well. So just this idea of malnutrition and that the malnutrition that is experienced by an individual um, is going to differ depending on the type or types of drugs that are being used. Um, it's gonna be impacted by the frequency uh, of use. It's gonna be impacted, especially when we start to talk about recovery um, what recovery looks like for that individual, whether it's residential or non-residential, um, all of those factors are going to be important for us to kind of keep in the back of our mind when we think about the role of nutrition in aiding um, and in increasing the likelihood of success for an individual um, in remission. Uh, the other thing too is that oftentimes individuals who are uh, in recovery, you know, we're talking about we're, we're taught, we have this vision of an individual in our mind, but they could also be living with other chronic conditions that are impacting their nutritional status. And so, you know, very common for HIV or hepatitis, which also have nutritional implications as well. So that just kind of layers on this complexity of an individual for an individual when they're thinking about nutrition um, and recovery. And then the last thing too, and I think it was on a previous slide, I, I'm not sure, or maybe I'm going to mention it later, but also is oral health which I think we, we tend to forget about how important that is. Um, you know, I, I, how our mouth feels, um, our teeth, that is a big determinant of what types of foods that we choose to eat on a regular basis, if it causes discomfort, if it's painful. Um, so, you know, we talk about this in other conditions, whether it may be, you know, a, someone who's receiving cancer treatment or whatever it may be, there are ser serious implications when it comes to oral health and being able to achieve the adequate nutrition goals that we have for an individual. So I think those are just kind of things that I want to put in the back of our mind that we continue to think about when we, we have this individual in our mind um, talking about recovery and nutrition. Okay, so again, I'm gonna spend a little bit more time on this slide because I do wanna draw attention to something on here that Alex has already kind of talked about and especially in regards to brain health. Um, so even for an individual who does not use drugs or is not in recovery, we can't overstate how important good nutrition is for overall brain health. So micronutrients help regulate mood. Um, we, you know, certain amino acids are precursors for serotonin. Um, so for example, tryptophan, which is an amino acid, it is required. Um, it's an, an essential amino acid. We have to have it in our diet. Our body cannot make it um, it's converted to serotonin, which again, regulates behavior and sleep and mood and aggression, all of these direct connections. Um, tyrosine and phenylalanine uh, also are two incredibly important amino acids that are involved in the production of dopamine and catecholamine. So specifically, we're talking about these, usually we think about micronutrients, vitamins and minerals, but also individual amino acids and also specific species of fatty acids that are used um, to support our overall brain health. Uh, there's even some studies out there that suggest um, omega-3 fatty acid supplementation during recovery um, because they actually saw that with supplementation of omega-3s, there was a reduction in the corticotropin releasing hormone, which is associated with violent and defensive behaviors. And so um, it improved mood and um, and the ability for them to actually be successful within their remission as well. Now, there, these are really preliminary studies. Again, we're kind of just scratching the surface in the, within this field and this space, so we certainly need to explore this more. But there is some promising literature showing, um, you know, yeah, supplementation with certain cocktails of amino acids and omega threes um, that may be beneficial, specifically for restoring brain function and brain health. Um, and that's obviously directly um, related to that next bullet there that's restored and regulated hormone signaling. So we're increasing dopamine, we're increasing serotonin and those types of things. Um, I, I don't wanna get into the nitty gritty too much here, but even increasing the consumption of B vitamins, zinc and antioxidants, we also see increased neurotransmitter signaling in the brain. And so that's gonna have some major implications as well on overall brain health. Now. I don't really know who is in the audience. Maybe your only experience with nutrition is the fact that you eat food. Maybe you have a degree in nutrition. I don't know, but I, I think it'd be fun if we could see in the chat kind of what is your previous background or training in nutrition? Is this the first time you've been to a talk about nutrition? I would love to see kind of the degree 
of uh, variability we have when it comes to um, what you know about nutrition as we kind of move forward in our presentation. Oh, look at this, a poll. This is amazing. How did you make that so fast? I don't know. That was incredible. We, magic. we already had it in. Oh you just my had gosh. a perfect question. That is amazing. So, okay. About half of you work in nutrition. Perfect. I work in both. I work in either. I work in mental health. Oh, and I'm hoping you can start to see really this overlap between the two of mental health and nutrition. Um, if you have a minute, we also have a question uh, in uh, what are some foods that give adequate amounts of tryptophan? Well, what do we always think of? Turkey, they say at Thanksgiving, um, but really it's going to be animal protein, which is the best source of those, all the essential amino acids. There are nine essential amino acids, tryptophan being one of those that our body can't make. Um, so varying different animal protein sources. Um, will be great. Oh, and we have a dietitian and substance use disorder field. I would love to talk to you, Danielle. Let's, let's be friends. Okay. So how do you come to this work? We've got some variability. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Okay. We'll keep moving. So some of this is a little redundant. Um, what else can nutrition do for the recovering body? I think the important thing here is just to know if if we know the common physical changes people in recovery are experiencing, it can help us explain the benefits of making those nutritious food choices when possible to them. They're gonna be able to see why this matters and, and maybe help with motivation for them um, putting some of these uh, nutritional recommendations into practice. So again, we've already touched on a few of these, but you know, um, we want to show you that there is a connection with the choices they're making maybe immediately in recovery, right when they're starting within the first 12 months of recovery um, with long-term outcomes. So we're going to be able to help stabilize their blood sugar levels. Um, that is a really important piece when we start to think about reducing the risk of developing chronic conditions in the long term. We're going to improve digestion, digestion so they feel better more likely to have an appetite, establish those regular eating patterns. Um, they're gonna be able to maintain that appropriate body weight for themselves. Um, all of this is kind of tied together. And then the last piece down here at the bottom are the life skills. So we're making a lot of assumptions right now when we're saying, oh, we just need to have good nutrition during recovery, but there is so much more that goes into it than just that. I am certain that individuals in recovery probably already know that fruits and vegetables are good for them. That's a, for all of us, right? That is the case. We've heard this since we were children, most likely. But there is a lot that goes in to preparing a meal for yourself. Think about, just work backwards from the last meal that you had. Maybe it was breakfast this morning. Your past self had to budget, purchase, properly store, then prepare that food. Those are a lot of skills and a lot of knowledge that's required to get to that step of you being able to actually eat that food. So, you know, if we're able to build those skills that are related to food and nutrition, we're going to increase self-confidence, self-sufficiency. Um, and this isn't only going to apply to their nutrition needs in the future, but to all aspects of their life. Uh, so if someone is not doing the shopping, preparing, even just making better food choices and building balanced meals, is a transferable life skill in of itself. Okay, so we're ultimately setting up this individual to better their overall ability to maintain a healthy and stable lifestyle, that healthy lifestyle management. So I just don't want us to miss those. So, um, you know, this is just another reminder that the short-term and long-term effects of substance use depends on a variety of factors. So I've already mentioned this, that is it the substance or substances used? the amount taken, the way in which the substance is taken, the health status of the person. Um, but generally when we think about an individual or a patient who is, ex, um, who is in recovery, when we think about nutrition, we kind of have three primary issues that rise to the surface. And so these are the three that I wanna kind of talk about that most likely your patient or the individual's experiencing. So this is, a, I think Alex already kind of stole my statistic here, so although it would be ideal to provide personalized advice for all patients or all individuals, 
I think it's going to be best if we kind of stick to general recommendations when we think about how to address these challenges. And one of the reasons being that nutrition isn't necessarily thought of and that the stat that Alex shared was 7%. And I was going to share that too, because 7% of recovery centers um, staff a registered dietitian nutritionist. And I understand that there are flaws and issues within the system itself of you know, supporting recovery centers and treatment facilities, but only 7% are able to staff a registered dietitian. Now, a little better is the fact that half of residential recovery centers incorporate nutrition education to some degree. So that's good. We need to continue to bump that up though. So registered dietitians and healthcare providers, those are gonna be the ones that are determining and treating those nutritional deficiencies and other serious nutrition related concerns that an individual in recovery may have. And so because that is limited within this space, that's why I think it is best for us to think about these issues broadly and to keep our general recommendations broadly, because regardless, even if they are broad recommendations, we're gonna to inch towards better nutrition overall. So that's why today kind of you're gonna be like, whoa, this seems basic, this seems really general, and that's one of the reasons why. So first of all, when we think about these challenges, um, it's gonna be weight gain. Now, Alex mentioned he gained a lot of weight in recovery, and that is not surprising in the least because especially in the initial stages of, reco of recovery, individuals are most likely to increase their BMI or to, to gain weight. Now, this is a significant concern for women, okay? So we tend to actually see weight gain is higher in women in recovery than men. And so there's one study, there's about 300 women, about a third of that sample reported that the reason that they initiated drug use in the beginning was for weight loss purposes. So there is a strong connection here with weight and drug use. 70% of that same sample were actually fearful of the weight that they would gain during recovery. And almost half of that sample reported that they were concerned that their weight gain would essentially be triggering or um, contribute to their relapse because they were so concerned about their weight. Now, this is a big deal. Yes, women are likely to gain weight in recovery and it's gonna be most likely faster than men, but we also have to consider the type of recovery the individual is experiencing because certain medications can also contribute to weight gain in the long term as well. Alex mentioned eating disorders, disordered eating, it's very high. In women who are in recovery, there may be strong reluctance to eat um, or to establish uh, eating patterns because of this. So this is certainly something that we need to keep in mind when we think about nutrition, physical activity, health promotion, education within a recovery center, that there may be some significant gender differences in how we approach those topics um, with these different populations. We also see that um, weight gain leads to increased nicotine use or diet pills are often sought in this space. And I think, again, one of my broad rec recommendations or thoughts here is how important it is that we use good language, positive language around food. So focusing on the positive aspects of eating a balanced diet instead of demeaning foods as bad or not good for you. Even encouraging the fact that it is okay for you to enjoy your food, to find that love for food. Um, that may be a new concept for people. And, even in my day-to-day -day work outside of the substance use space, how it breaks my heart for people to say that they don't enjoy food because they stress about it so much. So let's try to peel that back so people can just truly enjoy their food because we really want people to have and establish a positive relationship with food. And again, not lean towards those extremes for weight loss. So you can just essentially consider how you frame things as you teach and try to default to have a positive opinion about nutrition, which might be hard for some people. Um, again, just emphasizing that gender responsiveness piece. There are some individuals here across the U.S. that I know are working within this space, specifically in recovery settings, trying to explore what are the best avenues, approaches, and interventions that are needed, whether you're working with a male audience or a female audience talking about nutrition and recovery. So there, I think there will be more to come on that topic. The next one is craving confusions. Um, individuals in recovery have a very high affinity for high sugar foods, uh, nicotine and caffeine as well. And especially among people who use opiates, high sugar foods are a major preference, especially during the first six months of recovery. 
um, we do start to see that that levels off, kind of tapers off after the first six months um, as food intake and meals become much more structured and regulated. But essentially high intake of these substances with low nutrient foods cause changes in mood and it can increase certain cravings, which could be interpreted as a craving for a substance. Um, and it's dramatically gonna impact blood sugar regulation, which I, I'm not sure if you've ever experienced low blood sugar, but you do not feel well at all, or even high blood sugar, you do not feel well at all. So the importance of the, the body being able to ma maintain their blood sugar. So again, just encouraging balanced and nutritious meals can address this issue, especially if you're incorporating fiber and protein. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. And then lastly, our gut issues. Um, these are gonna vary depending on the point within recovery. So those who are experiencing really acute symptoms of withdrawal may be experiencing oh, everything, constipation, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting. Um, and I know that when I've experienced those things in the past, I certainly do not have any desire to want to eat a balanced diet or a meal. So that's gonna dramatically impact someone's food intake. And these exacerbate poor nutritional status, right? You're gonna have limited nutrient absorption, um, electrolyte imbalance, your hydration, hydration status, especially if you're experiencing vomiting or diarrhea. Just really important to keep in mind with an individual that are early on in their recovery. So what makes it tricky is that choosing a nutritious diet may actually help with all of those, right? So it's like, how can we get nutritious foods into them knowing that that really is something that's gonna alleviate or mitigate some of these symptoms they're experiencing, especially if they're nauseous, it could be really difficult. So it's helpful to have some knowledge of how we can increase calories or nutrition, um, even when we're managing the, the, those gut issues, the, the GI distress. Um, some experience upset stomach, um, you know, immediately after eating foods high in fiber, whether that's bloating or, or gas. Some individuals may be so depleted of fiber in their diet that we've even had some stories here in Kentucky where just one to two pieces of a raw vegetable really caused GI discomfort. And so that's going to also dissuade you from wanting to continue to eat those nutritious foods. Um, the, I think the good thing to know that that is temporary, right? In the moment, it could be very discomforting, um, but those tend to be temporary issues that over time, once we kind of get outside of the six months, um, tend to remedy. Uh, so slowly introducing foods with fiber is helpful in building tolerance, um, you know, really focusing on fruits, vegetables, whole grains, because they're going to get the most nutritional bang for their buck. Okay. So I, I want to step back. I don't even know what time it is. Oh, we're playing on time. Um, I want to step back here because I want to consider all levels of influence on the individual and their ability to procure and prepare nutritious foods. So outside of substance use, my work primarily focuses on, um, incorporates the socio-ecological model within rural communities, really thinking about nutrition security. So how can we ensure that individuals have reliable, safe, affordable access to nutrient-rich foods. Okay, so here within this population, we have to consider those spheres of influence um, on the individual during your cover. So this is gonna naturally address, naturally address you know, social determinants of health and re respects the socio-ecological socio model. So we have to let go of any assumptions we have about an individual and also consider the resources and assets they have in their life that will increase their nutritional status in the long term. So the first one is that food access piece, nutritious food access piece. Where are they able to get food? How often? Um, what is available? And if it is available, is it affordable? Um, if it's affordable, do they know and understand how to uh, prepare it, store it, use it? Um, and, and as Alex already mentioned, we know that nutrition security is a major concern among this populations. Uh, population, especially um, during drug use, because funds may have previously been used to access drugs and support their habits rather than invested in uh, purchase, purchasing nutritious foods. When we think about physical resources, this seems so practical, but these are really important questions. And these are important questions regardless really of who the population is, but you know, do they have a functioning kitchen? Do they have access to a kitchen? Are they able to keep their utilities on? Do they have access to clean water? Um, what does their kitchen equipment look like? So if we're saying we need to eat fruits and vegetables, 
You know, do they have a cutting board or a knife that is safe to use? Do they have a, maybe the only appliance they have to pre prepare food is a microwave. So these are, re I mean, it seems so practical, but these are really important questions to consider. Um, if they even have recipes, this isn't necessarily a physical thing, but are they able to read or have the math skills to be able to read and implement a recipe that they may receive? Um, you know, also thinking about how there are such high rates of homelessness among people who use drugs. So we need to understand really if the, if the individual has these work resources readily available to them. And then finally, um, thinking about financial resources, um, you know, obviously having the resources to purchase food, but even understanding and navigating food assistance programs, whether that is SNAP or WIC, um, you know, they may be unbanked. If, if, do they have a bank account? Do they have a place where they can put their money in order to be able to access it to purchase foods? Um, do they rely on others to procure food? So again, just trying to drop all of those assumptions and thinking about all the different influences uh, that are on an individual when it comes to making a food and nutrition related choice. Okay, so now I want us to move into this next section of the talk where we start to address some of these challenges we've identified and how we can best support individuals in recovery. So hopefully you can walk away today with an approach or a strategy to support nutrition and recovery. Um, again, kind of thinking and respecting those physical needs, how the body is healing and changing, um, the influences, the spaces and places um, that an individual is exposed to that may impact food and nutrition when in recovery. So um, here we're actually going to focus on some practical strat strategies to encourage with clients or patients, as well as practical strategies uh, for our educators, for practitioners who want to address nutrition education with an audience in recovery. So again, just kind of level set keeping in mind how complex this issue is, um, how complex the individual is themselves. Um, so I'm gonna focus on the literature for a few minutes and then I'm gonna share some of the exciting work that we are doing here at the University of Kentucky within our extension system and our SNAP Ed programming. So the first one, um, again, these are gonna seem really simple, but we're gonna kind of stick to those general nutrition recommendations is to eat three regularly timed meals a day and two snacks. Now for us, we're like, okay, but for someone who has, um, you know, little food intake, low appetite, has had a, a rather um, unstable or kind of chaotic lifestyle or pattern, this can be really difficult to achieve um, because we know irregular eating is so common in those who use, sub, um, who use substances. They go in long periods without eating, they may, on the extreme experience, experience binge eating in some cases. So again, really trying to establish regular eating patterns. We know that caffeine and nicotine use can be high early in recovery, which actually suppress appetite and can disturb regular eating patterns. So we need to keep that in mind. And then ultimately eating regularly will help stabilize blood sugar. Um, it's gonna kind of help minimize that craving confusion that we mentioned earlier. It's gonna help establish routine and a, a little purpose to their day, which can go a really long way. And then ultimately it's gonna increase the likelihood of receiving more variety of nutrients within their food. So that's number one, eat three regularly timed meals a day and two snacks. Now, when we think about that regular eating pattern or establishing that eating pattern, we really wanna to refer to my plate when making meal choices. So some of you on here, if you're in the space of nutrition, you have seen my plate a thousand times in your life. Maybe you're loosely familiar with it, but really this is gonna be the best guide when we're thinking about a general recommendation here. Um, you know, It's well documented that individuals who use drugs are less likely to meet recommendations for essentially all vitamins and, this, um, and minerals like iron, calcium, zinc, and selenium. They are more likely to meet macronutrient needs without meeting those micronutrient needs. So that basically means that the foods they're choosing are less nutrient dense. But if we focus on my plate, if we have an actual visual, if we have something that we can aim for, it's going to ultimately help us diversify the diet um, and add variety to the different foods that we find on our plate within each meal and each snack. So ultimately, we're going to be getting the energy and the calories that we need through the macronutrients, but we're making it more likely that we can achieve our micronutrient needs as well. 
So, you know, participants may be apprehensive at first, again, to eat those fruits and vegetables and whole grains due to, could be the fiber um, that's causing them some GI distress. So just having that slow transition to high fiber foods over time is gonna be the best approach. Um, when we think about snacks, I like to encourage uh, individuals to incorporate at least two food groups. So this is gonna ensure that we have a little bit of fiber or protein, which is really gonna help with satiety um, and help them you know, get to that next meal or snack, whatever it is. And then when we're choosing larger meals, um, ultimately three food groups or more is ideal. You know, we want my plate, we have this beautiful representation of what a plate should look like, but in reality, we just wanna be able to ensure that they're getting variety in the different food groups that they're, they're receiving. This is also gonna help them um, stabilize their blood sugar, adequate protein, more likely to have those essential amino acids um, over time. So as I've mentioned, some of the best literature in this field shows that specific amino acids and fatty acids may be helpful in physical healing, especially for brain health. And this balanced approach to eating just increases the likelihood that we're incorporating those really important micronutrients into the diet. Um, you know, when establishing a new eating pattern, also, I think this general recommendation is helpful because we don't want to single out specifically a new nutrient early on. Um, we get lots of questions about supplements, you know, for a specific thing, but I think really, if we could focus on a balanced overall diet, um, it's going to pay off in the long run. It's going to help restore gut health. It's going to help us establish the regular eating periods rather than always going towards looking for a, a supplement or another pill that they think that they can, uh, you know, get the nutrients that they need, but they may, that they're ultimately missing out on fiber. Um, protein powders are another thing that are often asked about within this setting, uh, especially by men who are wanting to, to gain muscle mass or, or um, are starting to exercise a lot. Um, but if we can truly encourage them to focus more on my plate and reaching those nutri nutrition needs through a balanced diet, it's going to pay off better in the long run. Um, and then the last one is to stay hydrated with water throughout the day. So again, you're like, this is so simple. But really, dehydration is so common with consistent drug use and also can contribute to imbalances in micronutrients and electrolytes. So if we are encouraging water, supporting um, water consumption, ultimately, we could probably dis uh, displace to some degree the amount of caffeine and sugar-sweetened beverages that are going to be consumed throughout the day. And also, I want us to think past soda when we think sugar-sweetened beverages. Um, you know, there's so many fruit-based drinks now coffee-based drinks out there, the energy drinks that Alex mentioned. And so really just encouraging them to try to over time increase their water intake throughout the day. Um, and then ultimately we know too, when individuals are better hydrated, it's gonna help them interpret their hunger cues a little, a little bit better. Okay, so again, you may think these are simple, too simple, or they need to be more personalized. And, and two things are true here. Yes, they are simple, but simple is a good step in the right direction when we're trying to build knowledge, confidence, and skills related to food nutrition. And I know that even myself, many of us on the call would also benefit from some of these recommendations, even though they seem so simple. Um, these are also easier to achieve for facilities who have residents who are in recovery. When we're thinking about policies and systems in place that could ultimately support nutrition within those settings. And so together, these general recommendations kind of address those major challenges we identify. They're going to slowly increase fiber. It's going to increase micronutrients that are found in the diet and can ultimately provide that foundation for physical healing. Um, the other thing that is true here is that in many recovery, for many in recovery, they would benefit from nutrition counseling and a personalized plan of nutrition care. But we're just not at the place right now where most facilities or organizations that work with individuals in recovery can provide that. So again, if there are opportunities to have that more personalized nutrition care, yes, that is ideal um, because we most likely need to look at clinical parameters, um, you know, looking at plasma levels of micronutrients, which would, could potentially reveal hidden deficiencies, those types of things, because we do know that anthropometric measurements are not reliable when we're in this setting to give us an overall idea of their health. Now, for 
for everybody, regardless of drug use or not, weight is not the best indication of health and should not be the only indication of health. So we do want them to be able to have access, if available, um, to more personalized nutrition care. Um, especially, you know, women, certain populations in recovery, they are more likely to experience certain deficiencies. So for example, women are more likely to experience iron deficiency or even iron deficiency anemia. And you do not feel well when you have anemia, you are very tired and fatigued. So you can kind of see this ripple effect you have if you can address some of these nutrition needs, how that's gonna make them feel better, feel better, do better. I think that was the little frame, that phrase that we had in our description. Um, you know, focusing on water intake. Um, if we can stay hydrated, that's going to kind of help us with those, like I said, electrolyte imbalances that we may have. Um, and, and just because they seem simple on paper or on a slide doesn't mean that they're easy to implement in everyday settings and in reality. So um, again, some general recommendations. And yes, SNAP-Ed provides nutrition education. Um, and we're, gonna, we're about to talk about that. Um, the last point I'll make on this slide is that these general recommendations may also be good conversation points. If you work regularly with a facility or if you um, work within a facility or organization that supports individuals in recovery, these kind of allow centers to establish policies that are encouraged, um, you know, improve nutrition. It could be as simple as ensuring water is provided at, during all meeting times. Um, or, with, or that all snacks have at least two food groups, food groups represented. So there are some small low hanging fruit um, when it comes to policy systems and environmental changes that line up with these general recommendations as well. Okay, so here in Kentucky, um, we, we were realizing how often our SNAP Ed program assistants within extension were working in recovery centers or with audiences that were in recovery. And I just saw someone in the chat mention that their SNAP-Ed works within recovery centers. And, and we saw that our program assistants were in residential settings, they were non-residential, even drug courts. And we repeatedly heard from our program assistants that the curriculum we used in Kentucky for general adult audiences was not meeting their needs. They were getting too many questions. There were some challenges that they were facing. Um, and so, we decided, you know what, we're gonna do something about this. And so this has been a long time coming because these initial conversations started, as, maybe it was even 2018, which is, seems like forever ago because of COVID. It was a different time, different world. Um, and so this curriculum idea was essentially initiated at the grassroots level. And so we have here in Kentucky developed a recovery specific nutrition curriculum which is titled Healthy, Healthy Choices for Your Recovering Body. And so essentially we aligned this curriculum with the literature, what was out there, some of these things that we were seeing, the most common issues that individuals in recovery were experiencing, um, and also addressed the challenges that our program assistants were experiencing when they were implementing the, less, the, their, the general adult curriculum. And so we hosted two focus groups with 19 of our program assistants back in January, 2019. And so we were intentional in that um, we wanted half of those program assistants to have experience in non-residential and the other half in residential. So, because we knew that there would be very different needs and challenges depending on where they were implementing. And so essentially during those listening sessions, a number of considerations and challenges were identified. Now I've listed out some of them and and maybe if you work in this space, this makes total sense to you. Maybe some of these are surprising, but we knew that these issues were gonna be important for us to address during the planning, preparation, development of this new curriculum, um, and even for future nutrition education interventions in the setting. So um, again, these are kind of helpful thinking about communicating with a facility or organization uh, if you want to implement nutrition education in the future, because um, we know if we can kind of overcome these, then we're more likely to be able to set up our participants for success. So some of these key uh, takeaways that we found was that there was some initial lack of trust and acceptance, and that was actually experienced more when the audience was primarily female. So again, there's some gender differences here when we think about how to approach education in this setting. Um, you know, no or little class participation, 
um, short attention spans, there were several restrictions on the type of materials and items that could be brought in to support the lesson itself. So some of these are very common, uh, common sense such as knife use, um, but then we started to learn about other ones that seem maybe a little bit more obscure. You know, they weren't allowed to have food thermometers. Um, they weren't allowed to have staples in handouts um, uh, or even plastic forks or pl plastic cutlery. Uh, a lot of the times the food, you know, there was a, either a recipe demonstration or sampling of a recipe. Uh, the food, the meals, whatever the program assistant was bringing in would have to be pre-approved. Um, no wireless connectivity, no AV options. Um, and then also we saw that a lot of the materials that we would use for general nutrition education with the general audience, you know, you have your, your sodium tubes, you have your tubes that show how much sugar is in different foods or um, the fat tubes that even the white powdery substance could be a trigger for some. So trying, how could we avoid um, putting some of those within our program? So we wanted to avoid those at all costs. So we have a QR code here and we were actually able to publish a paper that kind of talked about this formative work, these listening sessions. And so I put this up here if you're interested in scanning that so that you could go on and read uh, the full manuscript that we were able to publish that walks through um, a lot of these findings and then also provides some practical ideas and suggestions um, for implementation of nutrition education in this setting. So that was actually the formative work that led to the development of our new curriculum. SnapEd is incredible, absolutely incredible. So here, I just wanted to briefly walk you through the lessons that are included in this new curriculum. These were the ones that were deemed most important for our audience to learn. Um, and we incorporated both a strong emphasis on nutrition, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, food safety and physical activity knowledge. There was even some aspects of mindfulness woven into them. So this more overall holistic approach um, to health and well-being. Uh, Food preparation skills was emphasized by our program assistants that there were some very basic food preparation skills as far as like <clears throat> boiling water, <clears throat> excuse me, making pasta. So some of those types of things that we may take for granted each day. So we wanted to be sure that food preparation was incorporated into every lesson to some degree. Um, in addition, it was determined that food resource management skills were important to touch on. Um, so budgeting, making lists, and you know, knowing what you have and preparing meals with the food that you have um, is also incredibly important. So there's seven lessons in this curriculum. Um, here we have kind of the overall titles and a short summary of each. Um, so really we're taking serious the education piece, but also the skill building piece as well. Um, we know that that is a really important part of these lessons all together. So here, the, just a glimpse kind of at the participant resources. So within this program, there are multiple handouts and um, participant booklets that are provided for each lesson. And each booklet really is organized so that the first is the content portion, the written summary of the information that's gonna be provided in the lesson. And next is that food preparation skill. Um, so each lesson focuses on teaching participants how to prepare a particular type of food. So there are some recipe options provided um, and it might not necessarily be a recipe, but it could be just as simple as how to, in this case, put together a wholesome salad, right? So it's not necessarily a recipe, but really kind of the skills of knowing how to put together, whether a soup or a salad um, with whatever recipes you have. And then the final section of each booklet is the physical activity or kind of that mindfulness section. So there could be, you know, some simple exercises that they could be used to increase movement. Um, uh, practices for breathing, um, again, just kind of that holistic approach. Um, so here is lesson one, and I do want to highlight this one because we heard conflicting information about how much um, recovery or, or drug use should be incorporated into the curriculum itself. So some said the participants were frustrated because it felt like all day they were sitting in classes maybe, and it was all that they heard about. Um, and so when they learned about nutrition, it was kind of a mental break. But then some shared that it was really helpful 
to have explicitly the link between nutrition and recovery incorporated into the materials because it helped them take it more serious. They realized why it was important and it was motivating for them to learn about the, the content. And so for us, what we decided to do is have our first lesson and really only one lesson that is recovery specific. And ultimately it sets the stage for the rest of the program. So it's gonna, dis it, this specific lesson discusses the common nutrition related complications we discussed earlier, um, like gut health and, and cravings, those types of things. Um, and it covers also how important physical activity is when it comes to the recovery process as well. So we've actually been able to pilot this curriculum. Um, so in 2022 was actually the piloting that took place with this program. So it was a long time coming. Ideas were starting in 2018. We had the focus groups in early 2019 and then putting together the curriculum, COVID happened, time warp, I'm not sure. But ultimately we got to the point where we were able to pilot the program. And essentially what we wanted to do was compare our new program, which is Healthy Choices for Your Recovering Body, which is HCYRB, um, with the standard adult curriculum, curriculum that is used within our SNAP Ed programming. And so I'm just, I have a couple slides here. I won't go into it too much. I want to be sure we have plenty of time for questions at the end and to get through everything. Um, but this was a well thought out a pilot, essentially. <clears throat> and you'll be surprised because, and I know this is complex. I'm just going to go on to this next slide. <clears throat> we actually had about 500 individuals who participated in the pilot. So it's a pretty substantial sample size for us to be able to look at some differences. And the only thing that I really want to point out here within our demographics for our pilot is that there are twice as many males as females within our sample. And if you're in nutrition education, if you're within extension and to any degree, um, this is very different from who is usually participating within our programming. Um, we often see overwhelmingly that our, our audience is um, older adults or, or female. And in this case, we have um, a male audience um, which again is just is slightly different. And then this is where I think, and you know, we are just now kind of doing the analysis on this data, and that's why I don't have much to share with you. Um, is again looking at the gender differences when it comes to outcomes within this group, and the sample size might be large enough where we could actually do some of those types of comparisons. So again, we're still analyzing this data. We do, um, we did have some changes in staffing and personnel. So we haven't been able to move as forward as far on that as we thought that we'd want to. Um, but we do, I do wanna point out some initial data here. So we basically have um, Healthy Choices for Everybody, HCEB, which is our standard adult curriculum. And then we have our Healthy Choices for Your Recovering Body, which is HCYRB, I apologize for the acronyms. We have some scores within the categories of the, of the questionnaires, and we essentially just did some t-tests to compare mean, pre-test, and post-test scores within each curricula. And so basically what we see here is that within curriculum results indicate that our, our new curriculum um, focused on recovery is as effective as our adult general curriculum um, since both show statistically significant positive changes in, in knowledge and behavior from pre-test to post-test. And so here you see some of these categories we're looking at as far as cooking skills, food resource management, um, beverage and physical activity behavior scores, and then really important is food safety. That was actually highlighted by our program assistants as something that was the most eye-opening to participants. Um, they thought it was okay to just leave a pizza out all night on the counter and then they could just eat it for breakfast the next morning. And, and, and some of that really uh, was new content and, and they didn't realize how important food safety was gonna be. So just kind of a quick summary of our pilot. Um, so essentially we just, we were able to show so far that our new curriculum was effective for teaching nutrition, physical activity, food safety practices, food resource management to audiences who are in recovery. Um, and the really exciting thing now is that we are this fall uh, rolling out this curriculum across the state so that all SNAP Ed program assistants will now have healthy choices for your recovering body kind of in their tool belt. Um, so now that they can go in and maybe establish new partnerships with recovery or treatment centers in their area, and they have 
materials that they feel comfortable going in and addressing the specific needs, nutrition needs of this audience. Okay, and so to kind of just bring us home, we have about 15 minutes left. Um, I, what does this all mean? Um, and thinking big picture, and I wanna encourage you to kind of think back to what Alex shared about his personal experiences and kind of mapping the role of nutrition and recovery on Maslow's um, hierarchy of needs, as well as kind of the, the, the circles that make up recovery capital. So, um, you know, we have limited evidence in this field due to the lack of emphasis and focus on the topic. Um, but really, I want to make the case here, like Alex, that if we can focus on building some of these skills and instilling some of these nutrition-related behaviors in recovery, that we can ultimately consider this, these to be recovery capital. Um, and if we do that, you know, we have these benefits, this ripple effect, we're going to be able to sustain uh, positive nutritional habits that will ultimately support their long-term recovery, whether that is shopping for food, and I have procurement there because it may be that they are um, you know, receiving food from a food bank or a food pantry, uh, food resource management, meal planning, meal preparation, cooking, food safety. Again, lots of skills that we make assumptions that people have when it comes to supporting nutrition. Um, ultimately, collectively together, really, if we establish these skills, we're able to um, invest in healthy lifestyle management for individuals in recovery. You know, if they're, if they're able to put these into practice, they're more likely to meet their nutrition recommendations. Um, they're able, more likely to prevent or manage more appropriately chronic conditions that they have um, and maintain body weight. You know, ultimately they'll eat better, they'll feel better, they'll do better in the long run. So collective, these, these, collectively, these skills can really increase self-sufficiency and resiliency and ultimately should uh, be considered recovery capital. So again, I know several of you work within the space of within the space of nutrition. So as I talk through this slide, I would love for you to put in the chat what resources or opportunities that you know of where you live that you could ultimately leverage um, to help individuals meet their nutrition needs. So I just have some examples of what resources and skills. Um, could be out there that are available to support nutrition and recovery. Um, you know, recovery centers themselves and treatment facilities could be both residential and non-residential. They could prioritize nutrition. They could talk about it. They could recognize simply the importance of it um, when it comes to healing and physical outcomes. They, if they don't already, they could incorporate nutrition education into their programming. You know, if it's a residential center, having the residents participate in the food shopping and planning and preparation that takes place within that center itself. Um, you know, it's a physical space, most likely as a kitchen where individuals could learn some simple knife skills, food safety skills, those types of things. If we think about federal nutrition assistance programs, you know, we often think of SNAP and WIC first. Um, these are gonna help increase the likelihood that individuals can purchase or procure more nutrient dense foods. So maybe it's helping individuals enroll in these programs um, or if they're enrolled, ensuring they understand how they receive their benefits and how they can truly use them the most. Um, SNAP-Ed and FNET, so a couple of people have talked about SNAP-Ed in the chat here. It really can fill the gaps in nutrition education, food preparation skills. Um, I know other states are also working within this space. Um, they're incredibly, incredibly valuable within our rural communities, especially that have fewer resources, um, but coming in, filling the gap and providing nutrition education that is evidence-based, reliable um, and effective. And then cooperative extension, I you know, have to kind of toot our own horn a little bit here too, because I, I feel like sometimes going into conversations, it, people are surprised at the work that we're doing, the amount of uh, reach that we have with organizations. You know, we have Alex now doing the work that he does within Cooperative Extension. And so I know that Extension in most states um, is not only a primary supplier of SNAP-Ed programming, um, but they also have other programs that kind of support this recovery capital. So that's what Alex is all about, thinking about all of those aspects um, that ultimately uh, make it more likely, reduce stress that someone is able to stay in remission. 
And then every community is different. So there's going to be unique programs and organizations um, available to you where you are. So I know here in Kentucky, food banks and food pantries are leaned on often, um, you know, helping make connections with individuals who are in recovery to these organizations. Um, yeah. And, that, you know, some food banks, food pantries even offer nutrition education, whether that's the program like Cooking Matters, those types of things. So thinking creatively about what's available to you in your community that could help support nutrition outcomes overall. Um, th there's just a lot of opportunity here, even among who's on the screen, to align the work that we're doing, um, you know, align the work of these different entities, create some synergy. Um, so that we can all kind of move forward together, caring for individuals in recovery and thinking about nutrition. So yeah, if you want to, feel free to share in the chat. Would love to hear who else you think should be at the table, could be at the table, who could be leveraged um, or you know, share resources to support nutrition during recovery. Because if we're all from different places, we might have some different answers. Okay, just a couple more slides. So I, I do think it's worth acknowledging that when it comes to this concept of nutrition and recovery, that we've really only scratched the surface on the topic um, and that there's so much more that we need to explore. We need to learn so many questions. And so these are just, as I was kind of putting this talk together were some that came out to me, but ultimately examine um, the impact of personalized nutrition care, group education and learning, and didn't really touch talk on this today, nutrition standards collectively. So if you, again, this, uh, this is essentially the socio-ecological model, right? So we're thinking about the individual and, and ensuring that they have the knowledge and skills um, to, to make a positive nutrition choice, then collect, like their interpersonal level. So what's the group education, the dynamic, their learning space, and then the nutrition standards. You know, right now, unless the uh, treatment or recovery facility is, you know, is federally aligned in some way, there may be no nutrition standards at all that are expected. So just putting nutrition standards in place of what foods are offered and provided um, could also make a positive impact. But we don't really know if we collectively have all of these in place, what would be the impact on an individual who is in recovery? Um, we need to determine what the appropriate components of an individualized and comprehensive nutrition in intervention would look like during recovery, because we know both are important, the, the comprehensive, the general approach, but also if that individual truly needs um, more intense medical nutrition therapy. And then thinking about long-term, especially policy implications, if we're gonna move forward and, and make some big ripple changes here to determine to what degree nutrition-focused interventions during recovery increase long-term recovery success, reduce healthcare costs for patients. This is when we can start to have conversations about, um, you know, Medicare and Medicaid and coverage for um, medical nutrition therapy for individuals in recovery and really some like really lofty goals when it comes to moving the needle to ensure that nutrition care is provided to those in recovery. And then lastly, I have two slides, just a couple minutes left. Just these are the big takeaways, I think. If we go back to what our overall objectives were, the umbrella one was that we kind of consider nutrition in a different light now, recognizing how important it is. But here we have, we want you to see the relationship, the interconnectedness between nutritional status and substance use and how they affect one another. It goes both directions. Number two, that ultimately general recommendations are going to be the best starting approach, thinking about individuals in recovery. And we want to look for ways that we could support their personalized nutrition needs if and when those, those opportunities are available. And then finally, how all the food nutrition related skills that we've kind of talked about throughout today's talk, they ultimately increase self-sufficiency, resiliency, um, and are a part of that recovery capital that can reduce stress and in increase the likelihood of remission. And how essentially integral these he, you know, needs to survive water, food, nutrition are, um, if we can support those and improve those lower on that pyramid of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we're ultimately, ultimately going to make, help people feel better, um, better self-esteem, make it more likely that they're able to be successful in, re in remission.
So here, um, I just wanted to leave our contact information for you guys. So feel free. I would love to chat with some of you. I, um, I saw in the chat mention what you do in the space you work in. Here's my email. You're more than welcome to send me an email at any point and we can touch base and kind of talk about um, what we're doing and collaborating and those types of things. And then also wanted to include Alex's contact information as well. So Amanda, I know you've got a few more slides. You wanted to wrap us up or time for questions? Uh, yep, we're gonna do a little bit of housekeeping. You know, colleagues have to get going uh, into their day um, and we appreciate that. So a couple of quick things that we need to do, uh, just if you logged in with a link that was shared with you, so you didn't complete the registration form, that's fine. We love that, share it widely. We just wanna make sure that you get linked in uh, with Great Lakes Rota RC so that we can let you know more about what we're doing throughout the region. Uh, we have more events coming up yet this summer and we don't want you to miss those. So um, we have the website up there on, um, on the screen there. There. Um, Christina or Jen will pop it into the chat as well for me uh, to make sure that you get that. Um, if you can send us your full name and your email address, then we'll get you linked into our distribution. And we want to make sure that you get a certificate of attendance just to acknowledge um, your participation today because your time is valuable and we want you to be able to just acknowledge that, that you took the training today. The next thing that we want to do is we want to ask you to complete our evaluation for today. Let uh, Alex and Heather know how much you loved their presentation today. You've been giving them so much kudos uh, for what you've been hearing, what you've been experiencing today. Uh, we want to be able to collate that information for them um, and for our funder, SAMHSA. We report out every six months on uh, what we're doing, um, how that's going. Uh, so we want to be able to let SAMHSA know uh, about our great presenters, a great the about the great topics that uh, we're doing and how you are finding that. So that evaluation gives us an opportunity to do that. It also tells us, uh, gives us an opportunity to learn more from you about what you want to hear. What topics do you uh, want to hear more from, more about? Uh, we appreciate all of that feedback. So if you can just take a few quick minutes to do that, we sincerely appreciate you doing that. Um, and uh, we appreciate your time. The last thing that I will ask you to do, and you don't have to hang on to do that evaluation. If you could do that in your free time, we provide an opportunity. If you go back to listen to the recording, which I'll remind you will be on our website within the week, the recording, the slides, and a great toolkit that Alex and Heather have worked together or are working together with us to put together on resources throughout the region um, that reinforce what you've learned today. All of that will be on our website within the week. So you can get all of those resources continue to listen to this um, and, and pull from this after today's event. That will all be up. Um, so we want you to be able to, to utilize that. Um, uh, so, so look for that. Um, but we have more events coming up. Um, so next week we're back again. July has been such a fun month. Um, we've had really great presenters. Um, we want you to be able to, to come back again next week. We'll be doing Compassion Resilience. UW Madison has two educators that will be coming on who do a great job with Compassion Resilience. Make sure that you come back and see that. And then in August, we have um, three presentations, um, but the first one will be Parent-Child Interaction um, and Recovery in the Context of Substance Use um, with Dr. Dimitri Topidis. Um, that sounds like an amazing presentation. Uh, I've seen it actually, and I know it's awesome. Um, I hope you will come back and see it in August. So we're gonna pause the recording there. Um, we're gonna open it up to question and answer with Alex and Heather. So if you'd like to stay 